I'm Sam Roberts of the New York Times and welcome to the New York Times Close Up. The president and the vice president were in Atlanta last week delivering impassioned pleas for the passage of voting rights legislation. It would have required a change in Senate rules to pass, but cold water was thrown on that plan when Senator Sinema of Arizona said she would not support the suspension of the filibuster. That was yet another blow to President Biden's presidential agenda. And then there's Republican Senator Ted Cruz hinting at impeachment. Here in the city, the new mayor, Eric Adams, has already found himself in hot water after several controversial appointments. He backtracked on naming his brother Bernard as deputy police commissioner, appointing him instead in charge of mayoral security. He also named a former chief, Philip Banks, who was an unindicted co-conspirator in a 2014 corruption case as deputy mayor for public safety. Now, what might these appointments and others portend for an Adams mayoralty? Let's welcome back Clyde Haberman and Eleanor Randolph, both contributing writers for the New York Times. Well, this past week, we've had the first full year of the presidency of Joe Biden. Meanwhile, his approval ratings have been stuck in the low 40s. Eleanor, how come? Uh, we can point to things that Joe Biden has done, but those are pretty low approval ratings for this first year of the presidency. Why is that? Well, it's true. Those are low ratings. Uh, I mean, you I, probably you you have a long list. You know, you can go back to Afghanistan, the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which um, even though the Biden people said it was a success, uh, it it it, um, it it didn't go as well as hoped. Uh, the other thing is, I think looking at the economy, I don't know whether people have been in the you know just a regular big grocery store lately but many of those shelves are empty so you you find that what is there costs a lot more and um and and that's that's where people decide whether or not a leader is um succeeding i mean it's just it's very basic and i think you know if if they can unlock some of these um these transit problems and and get goods in the stores enough so that that um, that prices don't go up anymore. You you might find some um, some support for Biden. He's also, I mean, <clears throat> the um, the filibuster um, question. I mean, I for one feel that a filibuster should not be just somebody as Gail Collins says, sitting at home, punching a button and saying, I'm filibustering. If you're gonna filibuster, stand up in the Senate and talk for hours and hours and hours, you know, and that's what a filibuster is supposed to be. And, and I, don't know, I don't know why they can't change it back to that because that seems to me to be the way it should be done. Clyde, isn't that stalling? Isn't that a, a obstruction, whichever way you do it? Every one of those words. Uh, what fancies itself as the world's greatest deliberative body doesn't deliberate. Uh, and it, it, as Eleanor is saying, the filibuster has turned into not just a joke, but an immoral joke at this point. Uh, I'm separated even from the voting rights uh, issue. It is a stall tactic and uh, it should not be allowed. As for Biden, uh, I think, I think he may be finally shedding it. He finally, in his speech and pleading for the uh, for the uh, his voting rights uh, legislation, uh, finally began to get stronger. He is to some degree a prisoner of the Senate that he served for more than three decades, and he, I can't climb into his head, but from my where I stand, it's almost as if he thinks he's still in dealing with the same Senate that existed when he was there, and he has been there for 13 years. Uh, it's not the same. It is filled with ideologues. It is filled with absolutely horrendous creatures like Ted Cruz. Um, it is filled with absolutely amoral, I'll say anything to get what I want and flip that position 180 degrees if it serves my purposes, Mitch McConnell, and we could go down the line. And it's a sad situation then in a 50-50 deadlock Senate 
two people who deserve to be ignored uh, forever, uh, like Joe Manchin and, and Christian Cinema, uh, have the whip hand. Uh, and I don't know how he gets around either of those two people. Frankly, uh, um, I think it's impossible. Eleanor, taking up that point, we keep reading, uh, of course, depending on your point of view, a lot of articles about uh, apocalyptic uh, futures if Donald Trump uh, runs and gets reelected in 2024, if Congress uh, goes Republican this year, we're saying that this year for the first time, uh, and what this portends for democracy. How serious a worry is this really? Uh, and you know, how worried should, should Americans be? And if they are worried, what should they do about it? You know, um, Sam, you'll have to forgive me. I know this is a hobby horse of mine, but the thing that you are seeing right now that is really alarming and sort of makes me worry for our democracy is not so much Trump running for office, it's what's happening in the state legislatures. And what has happened is that people sort of, they think, oh, I'm not gonna worry about the state legislature, I'm just gonna worry about voting for a member of Congress or a president. But the truth of the matter is that the Republicans have been much smarter than the Democrats about taking over these state legislatures and they are uh, now into the weeds, into the nitty gritty about how we, how we vote and how you uh, certify a presidential ballot. And so if, if there's something that I'm worried about personally, it is how these state legislators are reading the constitution in ways that give them uh, more power to actually skew the vote in favor of a person they approve of instead of maybe the person who actually got the most votes. So, I mean, so my bottom line is people care about the state legislature, uh, vote for uh, legislators that you can trust. It's, I mean, I know, I know, I know it's hard to find, but still, that is where um, that is that is the foundation in many ways of what we have in Congress, and and now how our voting rights are skewed. Clyde, uh, the president held his uh, only his second formal press conference this past week, second of a year. What would you have wanted to ask him? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I hadn't thought about it. Um, but I guess one thing uh, I might ask is, when are you going to absolutely uh, get tougher uh, with your own party members? He has, he has ways of convincing recalcitrant people. It is difficult. I do it, you know, Senators Cinema and, and Manchin are good examples of that. But there are ways to deal with it. It just may not be in his personality uh, uh, that way. I, I thought you were going to ask, uh, why hasn't he had more press conferences? I and I and I'm glad you didn't ask it because I always find it's a bogus uh, <laughs> point raised by uh, CNN and uh, MSNBC types of why isn't he? He's out there virtually every day speaking and takes questions uh, as uh, his predecessor did. Uh, uh, Donald Trump didn't have that many formal press conferences either. Uh, but it, it's um, look. Eleanor dealt quite correctly with the fact that our democracy to, some, to a large degree rests in, with state legislatures and how they're going to skew our, our national voting, not to mention their own state's voting. But we do have a national problem. We have a, a, a major party, the Republican party, that is totally in the grips of extremists that even the people who are considered moderates like uh, Mitt Romney and Susan Collins, uh, uh, go in lockstep on things that you know they don't agree with uh, the McConnells of the world and the Ted Cruz's of the world, not to mention uh, uh, the really far right crazies. And it's um, it, it's really disturbing that we we our our two party system is no longer really functioning. And is it a threat? The part of me that's an optimist would like to think no, that we're better than that, uh, but. I'm not 100% sure anymore for the same reason. I don't understand why 73 million people voted for Donald Trump. I, I, every day I ask 
myself, don't you see who he is? He's a demagogue. He's a, a despot wannabe. He just wasn't very good at it the first time, but he might be better at it the second time if you give him the chance. He was pretty good at it the first time, actually, for those of us in New York who know him. Eleanor, uh, you opened the door to state legislatures. Uh, tell us uh, uh -oh. what's going on in New York with uh, Kathy Hochul. Uh, we saw Mayor de Blasio, I can't even say he dropped out of the race. I'm not sure he was ever in the race for the Democratic nomination of governor. The interesting there thing there that I noticed was he was in second place uh, in the polls for the Democratic nomination uh, and how far behind the other candidates were. How do we handicap that race? Is the nomination Kathy Hochul's to lose? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's that poll showed her at over 40, like 41 percent. And then uh, de Blasio came in second and I think it was 12 percent. So that's a big gap. And I think de Blasio finally realized that he he wasn't going to be able to raise the kind of money she's raised. She's raised over 20 million dollars and she's on a roll. I mean, she's the primary is going to be interesting. The two candidates that that are still there right now, one of them is Congressman Tom Swazi uh, from Long Island, and he could take away some of her uh, centrist uh, votes in the Democratic Party. And the other is Jumani Williams, a public advocate in, um, the, in New York City, who did very well running against Kathy Hochul for Lieutenant Governor last time around. She's riding very, very high right now. She's got a very huge state budget. She's handing out goodies here and there. It's over 200 billion. That's, that's a wonderful place for a politician to be. I would say if I could, the sort of um, the thing to watch with her is that money she's gotten from the uh, in the campaign. And it's, as I said, it's over 20 million. And there's some questions about where that money has come from and whether all those people are people who who want something from New York State. And having spent some time in Albany, I know how they have these parties and, you know, people suddenly, you know, somebody's bringing in $20,000, somebody who wants some sort of state contract down the line. So she's, um, there are, there are hazards right there. And um, so but Tell we her you're so cynical, really. No, no a, a cynic is a premium. <laughs> I, I believe, can't help it. I, I define a cynic as a premature realist. And, uh, the um, look, we have not. I can't remember the last time we had a governor from uh, outside New York City in its immediate area. So uh, she's from the Buffalo well, area. Well, Pataki. And uh, Clive, there was Pataki. Well, but I don't consider that completely out of the New York uh, uh, region. I mean, he's from Peekskill. It's a, it's a suburb. Practically. Clive, you raised a good point about one of the candidates in the race, Jumani Williams. Yeah. Well, this was in our uh, uh, conversation uh, off screen. I, I, I am, and I can't believe I'm alone, offended that two weeks after he was elected to uh, be public advocate for a full term, uh, he announced he wants, doesn't want that job. He wants to go off and run for a governor. He hadn't even been sworn yet. Uh, I wouldn't vote for him. I know I'm probably not supposed to say this on a show like this, but I wouldn't vote for him just because of that. Uh, uh, he was elected. Uh, to be public advocate. I grant you it's not the greatest job on God's earth, but uh, it's the one he ran for. He should at least take the oath of office before uh, before he uh, announces that's not a job he's interested in. I, I think uh, New York voters have every right to be offended by his behavior in this regard. And Eleanor, very quickly, uh, are we uh, at risk by ignoring the Republican race for governor? Oh, yes, always. You know, I mean, that's you uh, if you if you look at how uh, some of the constitutional changes are um, uh, failed last year, um, you know, there's a vote out there that is really very conservative. And so um, I would say that, you know, that we should look very I mean, the three candidates running of the three candidates running, probably Congressman um, 
Lee Zeldin from uh, Long Island has the strongest record. We should be watching that side of the race. Okay, we will be watching it as the year goes along. And thanks to Clyde Haberman and Ellen Aranda for joining us. Coming up next, we'll look at the New York Times' Headway Initiative. Last month, the New York Times launched the Headway Initiative, a way to look at the world's challenges through the lens of progress. Reporters will explore topics like poverty, clean water, HIV, looking past the headlines to see what headway, if any, has in reality been made to surmount these conundrums. The project was conceived initially by Times architecture critic, Michael Kimmelman. He reported on one of the first headway pieces about the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. In March of last year, the Times brought on Matt Thompson as lead editor, and we're pleased to have both of them here with us today. Michael, uh, you explored the effort to redesign Lower Manhattan in the wake of the hurricane, design planning and design challenges that have proved once again that progress is incremental. And you looked at East River Park in particular, sort of a parable of participatory, participatory democracy, how we try to reconcile the urgency of a problem like dealing with the environment with uh, participatory democracy, inclusion, transparency, uh, how we deal with these urgent challenges. What did you learn from looking at that process? It's easy to be discouraged, I should say, that um, you know, the deeper you get into projects like this, which you know, are really in the weeds of how cities work, how communities make decisions, how democracy works itself, it, it is possible to, I think, feel that large scale change is impossible, that it's really difficult. But I also think that if you step back from what happened at East River Park, of course, there are people who will always be upset about the final decision that was made. We don't know how it will pan out. It's not the best uh, solution on in the abstract. But in fact, it is a fairly significant um, sign that despite all the obstacles we create for ourselves, um, it is possible to move ahead. We are doing something significant in a an area of uh, public housing projects long underserved. Um, we're committing, you know, over a billion, maybe two billion by the time it's done dollars uh, to creating a new public uh, space that will also provide flood protection uh, for for hundreds of thousands of people in that neighborhood. So, I mean, I think the lesson really is that to have a conversation about meaningful progress means being realistic and, and dealing with the complexities, not making you know, false assumptions about what is possible, but not giving up hope either. And, and that's, I think, the goal of Headway, to have a constructive conversation about what can be done and what the obstacles are. Matt, you raised a fascinating question uh, in the Times uh, recently. How do we measure progress? And I recently read the book uh, Sapiens, which seemed to suggest that uh, in many ways we were better off uh, centuries or even millennia ago when uh, in part our expectations were so low. Uh, we spent a lot of time not working. Uh, we didn't have to do much. We had to gather some food to get us through the day. Uh, so how do we measure progress? And you asked Times readers also to uh, give us what their expectations were. Uh, what kind of response did you get to that? We got a ton of responses. I would say um, uh, more than a thousand responses uh, of people sending us their notes, telling us what progress meant to them, what it looked like in their communities, and their reactions to some of the lessons that we shared looking at past predictions um, for what would happen by 2021 and seeing how the outcomes fared. And what people said was first, they many folks said that they were surprised by how some of these past goals had played out. We looked at goals 
such as uh, the goal to have the number of people living in extreme poverty as defined by the UN, in, according to the sustainable development goals. And uh, what we found was that that goal had been surpassed. Of course, to understand what it means to surpass that goal is to get again deeper into what, how do we define extreme poverty? What does that mean? Um, what what is the bar for lifting someone out of extreme poverty? We looked at things like the pledge to expand access to clean drinking water around the world and found, again, there's a complex story that the UN had set the sustainable development goal that, um, that it, it, according to the definition that they started with, do people have access to water from improved sources? They had met the goal, but that that did not necessarily translate to the drinking water that people had access to being safe. So findings like those um, both surprised people. I think it awakened, we heard from a lot of people that awakened their curiosity about what was possible on a global scale, what kind of change was possible, particularly when humankind sets a major target and mobilizes behind achieving it. Um, and we heard some folks say that they had um, expected all of the or most of the forecasts to turn out poorly and were surprised by what actually did turn out well. They had approached uh, this exercise with pessimism and found themselves um, a bit more either hopeful, optimistic, or at least attuned to the possibilities of what might occur. We, the one thing that we heard, I would say, fairly consistently about progress is that particularly on a global scale and on our largest challenges, it can be hard to detect if you don't have a good sort of fixed point of reference, if you're not looking at what might be possible and are we moving closer to it or are we moving farther away from it over time. You've got to have goals and you've got to hold people accountable, I guess. Uh, Michael, you pointed out that rebuilding ground zero was kind of a mess, yet lower Manhattan kind of bloomed anyway. Uh, what about the cost of good intentions? Uh, we look back at some of the things that were planned that didn't turn out quite the same way. Uh, and we look at the, the things that uh, boomerang to some extent. So, do we miss uh, Robert Moses who could get things done? Uh, not all of them good, of course, many of them not, uh, but some of them uh, we look back on and say, you know, good that we had them. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting point, um, Sam, because by the way, Robert Moses built East River Park, the place that I uh, wrote about in, in uh, that first tranche of pieces we did, and that is a wonderful thing. And the very people who uh, were complaining really about the sort of top-down government decision to rebuild that park um, are the people who liked the fact that Robert Moses, a kind of the ultimate top-down government guy, had a, you know insisted that we add landfill to Manhattan and build that park. So, I mean, the there is no single answer. And I think, you know, we face enormous problems that require enormous resources and uh, collective efforts um, and that are not necessarily going to be possible uh, with the kind of um, community-based activities that um, were a response uh, to the sort of Moses view of the world that somebody at 30,000 feet looking down on maps knows what's best for people. So, sometimes you need, you need a mix. I think one of the interesting things though, and Matt was alluding to this too, is you know, we live at a moment when I think there's an enormous amount of despair and sense of hopelessness. And, and there's a lot of news about how badly everything is going. There's even news about the fact that things are going okay, but we're not talking about that enough. And I think what people hunger for is as I said earlier, a kind of constructive conversation, a realistic one, not one that simply ends up reminding us of all of the difficulties and impossibilities, but that, that allows us to engage as a broader public um, in, in, a, in a meaningful discussion about what, what we can do and how best to get there. 
And I, I think we need that right now on a lot of fronts. And some of that is going to involve the kind of mm, fundamental democratic decision-making, which is uh, involves compromise uh, that we are finding difficult. So hopefully these discussions around a lot of issues will feed off one another, uh, you know, and, and, and promote a somewhat different climate around uh, some of these big topics, which are so filled with despair at the moment. Matt, uh, you're talking to us from California, where you're based at the moment for the New York Times. Is California still the future, or is New York, uh, with its own ideas, uh, catching up? You see, um, I am going to misattribute this quote, but you know that quote, the, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And I think that's true within California. I think that's true within New York. I think that's true really all over the world that uh, it, it's hard to look at a spot in the world and not find something that characterizes a future that, that one of our other cities somewhere around the world is going to experience. I think even in the past few months, as we've been reporting on things like housing in California and in New York and elsewhere around the country, um, you can see there are spots within California that look like the direction that other communities are headed towards. There are spots in, a, in a, a Connecticut, in Texas, that look like a, a, another possible future for some of our cities. Um, so I would say I, I would say it's probably way too simple to say that California is the future. I would say that there there are things happening with, within California that uh, that it, 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 any other community might look to as being its future, um, positive or negative, for good or ill. Um, and that that sense of possibility is probably important an important one to maintain. I think that comparative lens is one of the things that makes this effort. Um, really uh, illuminating to me, um, the ability to look at a place and ask, okay, what does this place have to teach us about where my community might be heading? I'm glad we could end on an optimistic note. Thanks to Michael Kimmelman, Matt Thompson of the New York Times, the Headway Initiative, and for the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.